faithful friends and other friends who are watching this video. I hope you all had a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and we're ready to face 2021, hoping for a better year and a year where we can get back together, be in our church and in our Sunday school classroom. Let's open with a word of prayer before we start our lesson. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for these days, weeks and months in the coming year where we can do what we need to do to get past this pandemic. We ask you to get us back together as soon as possible because we want to see all of our friends and Sunday school class members. Be with those who are not well, who need your loving care and your hand on them to heal them. We know there are numerous ones. Be with them as they deal with whatever is a problem for them at this time. We ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, y'all, today's lesson is called The Firstborn of All Creation, and it is the third lesson in a unit called Our Loving and Creating God. This unit explores what the Bible says about creation and God as creator. Our lesson is unique because it expands upon the role of God and looks at the relationship between the Father and the Son. It goes beyond God as the creator and looks at the role of Jesus in creation. Now I have to confess, when Jesus' name comes up, I think manger through crucifixion. And if somebody says something about creation, my mind goes to Genesis. Well, this lesson will expand on our idea from the manger and will explore Jesus' role in creation. We are in the book of Colossians which is a letter that was written by Paul from jail in Rome, and it was written to the church at Colossae. Now, Colossae had once been a powerful trade city in Turkey, but at the time that Paul's writing to this, which is about AD 60, this town had become a second-rate marketplace, but it did have a church, so it becomes important to us. The town, which is still named Colossae, and is still in western Turkey, uh, is right off the coast. If you go south to southern Turkey and you find the island of Rhodes, and then you go just a little north and a little bit to the east, there is Colossi, still in southwestern Turkey today. Well, a young follower of Paul, his name was Epiphus, had started this church in Colossi, and he was very concerned because it was under attack by people reporting false teachings. And so he went to Rome to speak with Paul about this, and the result was a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. Now he never tells us, Paul never tells us what those false teachings were, but scholars have looked at this, and based on what Paul has to say to them, they believe that the, the false teachings fall into two categories. One is an extreme form of Judaism, and the other is early Gnosticism. Now, y'all, we could spend forever <laughs> looking at those two things, but that'll have to be another lesson because our lesson goes on from there. We enter the letter uh, that Paul has written that he offers to the worshipers at Colossae, and we're at the beginning of this letter, which is Colossians 1, 11 through 14. It says... May you be made strong with all strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption for the forgiveness of sins. Paul wants the saints of Colossae to be made strong with glorious power of the risen Son of God. This power is limitless, and so is the request of Paul's prayer. Paul wants the people to have this power, not so that they can perform miracles, but so that as children of God, they may have patience and long-suffering, but joyfully, give thanks to God for what they have. Paul also prays that they may be, have a thankful spirit and never fail to thank God 
who brought them into the light. God, Christ, and Christians are symbolized by light. God has brought the Christians out of the power of darkness and now has brought them under the benevolent rule of God's Son. Christ has brought us redemption through his death on the cross and thus we are forgiven our sins. The next group of verses, 15 through 20, is actually a hymn of praise and it's thought by scholars that it was an early Jewish hymn. The hymn may be a hymn of praise of divine wisdom. Uh, one, our study guide states that in early Judaism, wisdom sometimes stands in as the personification of God. And in Proverbs 8.22 tells us the wisdom that wisdom was God's first act of creation. It seems possible that early Christians took this hymn and made it about Jesus, who was God's expression of wisdom and the word. Let me also say that many of the tunes to the hymns that we sing today actually were Jewish hymn tunes. If you think about it, congregational singing was not really popular until after Martin Luther expressed his desire and wrote a lot of hymns. Well, the tunes in many of these are actually from Jewish hymns. So it's not at all unusual to think that early Christians would have taken this hymn, made it into a poem about Jesus who was God's expression of wisdom and the word. Another way to look at the hymn is the connection between cre uh, creation and redemption. Uh, let's look at the creation part of the hymn first. Now, let me go back and say, I think that Paul was using this hymn to teach the Colossians about correct theology. They were hearing all kinds of unusual things and were falling for heretics who were preaching unusual things and he's trying to straighten out their theology and I think this is part of the way he's doing it with this this hymn and this is the beginning of it which is again as I said a, the creation part of the hymn it is Colossians 1 15 through a 18 a he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the church. He is the head of the body, the church. Paul's first statement is that Christ is the image of the invisible God. By this, he means that Christ is the perfect manifestation of God. If we want to know what the invisible God looks like, we only need to look at Jesus. Jesus is the representation of God that we can see, know, and understand. Jesus was also the firstborn of creation. According to Dr. Charles Barkley, we need to be careful about the interpretation of the word firstborn. If we think about the word with an English connotation, we could take the phrase to mean that God, that, that the Son of God was the first person to be created. This was not the case. In the Hebrew and Greek language, the word firstborn is most often a title of honor with no relationship to time. When Paul refers to Jesus as the firstborn of creation, he means that Jesus holds the highest honor from creation. Dr. Barclay says that the phrase could be translated, he was begotten before all creation. Verse 16 tells us that by the Son of all things were by the Son all things were created. Everything in heaven and in earth, things seen and unseen, all were created by and for the Son. It is also the Son that all things hold together. The Son provides the laws and order that hold the world together. They are the scientific laws, also the divine laws, such as the law of gravity. Then the Son is also the head of the church. Jesus created the church and directs the actions of this new creation. Now the latter half of the poem 
describes Christ in redemption. This is a part that I think we are much more familiar with. This is Colossians 1, 18b through 20. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the faithful, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to re re reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, or by, my, by making peace through the blood of his cross. The remainder of the poem looks at the Son as the redemption. Paul tells us that the Son is the firstborn among the dead. He did not merely mean life, he mean to live and die. Jesus was resurrected, which gave him everlasting life. The Son is a living presence. We are reminded that there were several people mentioned in the Bible who were resurrected from death to life. But unlike Jesus, they did eventually die. His everlasting life indicates his supremacy in all things. There is nothing that in life or death that can bind him. He is the firstborn from the dead and the head of the church. That position allows God's fullness to dwell perfectly in him. He is the perfect image of God. The Son is also the vessel through which God reconciled all things to himself through the blood of the Son on the cross. Paul concludes by telling the church at Colossae what all this means to them. This is in Colossians 1, 21 through 23. And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in faith, without shifting from hope promised by the gospel that you heard which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. The church at Colossae was reminded by Paul to hold to their reconciled position to God by re remaining steadfast in faith. They were told to hold fast to the hope promised them by the word of God and what they had heard. He ends by telling the church that he is a servant, a follower of this gospel. The Colossian church had been tempted and intrigued by false teachings, and Paul used the words of this poem to remind them of the true gospel. He described the situation in which Christ was the link between creation and redemption, and reminded the congregation of the vaulted status of Christ as the image of God. False teachings are present all through history, and as Christians, we need to be alert to those who would pervert the teachings of the Bible. Our church leaders are available to help us to make correct decisions concerning, concerning true theology, but we should always be alert to false teachings and pray for the direction from God to avoid false teachers. Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for making it clear to us that there can be false teachings and that we need to be aware of this, to be careful, to be on guard, to study the right things, to ask the right people, to understand exactly what it is that we believe in. We thank you for this lesson, for the direction that we can go if we need trouble, if we need help in times of trouble. Be with us in the weeks to come. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.